Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over hypoparathyroidism. In the next video I'm going to be covering hyperparathyroidism, so be sure to check that out so you can compare these two conditions with each other. Now this video is part of a thyroid disorder NCLEX review where I'm covering a lot of thyroid disorders that the NCLEX hits on. So be sure to check those videos out if you are reviewing for your NCLEX exam. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to cover the patho, the causes, the signs and symptoms, and the nursing interventions along with medications for what you do for this condition as the nurse. Now after you watch this video, please go to my website, registerednursern.com, and take the free quiz that will test you on your knowledge of hypo versus hyperparathyroidism and a card should be popping up so you can access that. So let's get started. First, let's start out talking about what is parathyroidism? What is the definition? In a nutshell, it is a low production of PTH, parathyroid hormone, by the parathyroid glands. And your parathyroid is responsible for regulating your calcium levels along with your phosphate levels. And if you have low secretion of parathyroid hormone, you're gonna get hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. And here in a second, you will see why through this little negative feedback loop. Now, your parathyroid is located in your neck behind your thyroid gland. This little pink area is your thyroid gland, the back view of it. And the green areas are your parathyroids. You have four of those. And how this whole system works is it's stimulated by low calcium levels. A normal calcium level is 8.6 to 10 milligrams per deciliter. So when your parathyroid senses that there is a low amount of calcium, less than 8.6, it releases parathyroid hormone because the whole goal is to get the calcium level back up. So your parathyroid hormone acts on the kidneys and the bones because they're going to help increase that calcium level. And let's look out at how it does it. Okay, so whenever PTH is released, it causes the kidneys to reabsorb calcium, which is going to increase your calcium levels. But it also plays a role in excreting your phosphate level. So the kidneys play a big part in keeping your phosphate levels nice and regular. And it also, your kidneys, this PTH will cause the kidneys to activate vitamin D. Now remember from the other lectures, and especially the electrolyte ones about calci calcium, vitamin D plays a huge role in absorbing calcium. That's why a lot of times whenever patients are prescribed calcium supplements, it'll be with vitamin D with it because it helps you take it up. Now this vitamin D causes the small intestines to reabsorb the calcium that you've taken in through your food. So again, it's going to increase the calcium levels through that way. Now, PTH also affects the bones. It causes the bones to stimulate the osteoclasts. What do osteoclasts do? They break down bones. Now this causes bone resorption. And whenever that happens, it releases calcium into the blood. So then you increase your calcium levels to that normal range of 8.6 to 10. And then this temporarily comes to a halt. And then whenever the calcium level falls again, it starts all over. It's like a little looping effect. Now let's look at what causes hypoparathyroidism. Okay, the biggest cause, the most common cause of hypoparathyroidism is destruction or manipulation of the parathyroid glands. When does this happen? Generally, it can happen during a thyroidectomy, removal of the thyroid gland, or treatment of cancer through the neck or the throat. And the reason is, is because as we've seen in this drawing earlier, your parathyroid glands are very close to your thyroid. So whenever they go in there to remove the thyroid gland, they can mess up the parathyroids. And plus they share the same blood supply. So that can cause it to be messed up. So after a thyroidectomy, you wanna monitor those calcium levels because you might've sent them into hypoparathyroidism. Another thing is a low magnesium level, hypomagnesemia. And what, um, whenever you have low magnesium levels, it inhibits PTH secretion. 
So mag's low, your parathyroid is going to be trying to release this parathyroid hormone, but it can't because the magnesium levels are so low. And then you're going to go into this. Another condition is autoimmune. For some reason, the body produces an antibody to attack the parathyroid gland, which des destroys it and it can't work anymore. And another cause, last but not least, is body, the body is resistant to the parathyroid hormone. Uh, the parathyroid releases PTA, works great, but for some reason, the kidneys and the bones do not care. So they don't do their role of reabsorbing calcium, um, excreting FOS, or stimulating those osteoclasts. So you can get those calcium levels increased. So it just doesn't work. Now let's look at the signs and symptoms. What are those big signs and symptoms that this patient's gonna have who's suffering from parathyroidism? Well, to help simplify it, let's remember the mnemonic PTH. What does PTH stand for? Parathyroid hormone. Okay, the first P, paresthesia. What is that? It is tingling of the mouth, the lips. Um, they can have it on their face or their fingers. So the patient's going to be complaining of this tingling slash numbness. Also, the other P, they can have a positive trousseau sign or stavoxtic sign. Okay, what's a trousseau? You need to know, even for um, low calcium levels, how to elicit these responses, because NCLEX loves to ask this. So trousseaus, this is where you put a blood pressure cuff up on the upper arm, you inflate it above the systolic, hold it there for about three minutes, and if the patient's calcium is low, and um, the arm will be relaxed, you will see the hand involuntarily, the patient's not doing this to themselves, will contract like this. So that's trousseaus. What's Chabot sticks? Chabot sticks is where you are going to elicit a response in the facial nerve. So to do that, you will go to the angle of the jaw and you will tap on the masseter muscle. And on that same side, you could see twitching of the nose or of the lips. And that would indicate a low calcium level, a severely low calcium level. Okay, T for tetany. This will be severe. And what is tetany? Tetany is where you have involuntary muscle contraction and cramping. And this again is due to your low calcium levels and your high false levels. That's why you're seeing pretty much all these symptoms is because of the low calcium and, phos and the high phosphate levels. And this can lead to bronchospasm, seizures, laryn laryngeal spasms, um, Feet and hands will spasm, have spasms and EKG changes. So not good. Airway is a major issue with these patients. Last part of the mnemonic is the H. And again, you're going to have hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. Okay, so what are the nursing interventions? What are you going to do for this patient? Number one, you want to monitor their calcium and phosphate levels. Again, normal calcium is 8.6 to 10 milligrams per deciliter, and phosphate levels normal are 2.7 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. You're also going to monitor that airway because of that tetany. So you want to make sure, just as an emergency precaution, that you have a trait kit, oxygen, and suction at the bedside in case the patient starts having some spasms. Also initiate seizure precautions. And you want to ensure that this patient is eating a high calcium and low phosphate diet. So again, Tess love to ask, what would you feed this patient? What are the best options? So some foods high in calcium are like dairy, your green leafy vegetables like spinach. And phosphate, foods that are high in phosphate that you want to avoid with these patients are soft drinks. Meats and eggs, those are high and false. Okay, now let's look at the medications. What are you gonna be administering per doctor's order for these patients? Things you need to know for NCLEX. Okay, our whole goal of why we would be giving medications is to correct that low calcium level. So we want to increase calcium and bring our phosphate level down. So how are we gonna increase calcium? Normally the physician will order, if the calcium is really low, IV calcium, like calcium gluconate. However, one thing you need to keep in mind about calcium gluconate, if your patient's on DIG, calcium can increase, um, calcium salts can increase DIG toxicity. So you want to monitor your DIG levels, make sure they're not having any signs and symptoms of that. So remember that. Um, also, they may be, after you gave them IV calcium, once you get those levels a little bit normalized, they may be started on oral calcium with vitamin D. Again, vitamin D to help um, with the absorption of calcium in the gut. However, um, 
some patient education and side effects is that they can have GI upset with this, constipation, make sure they're getting plenty of fluids, and also there's an increased risk of kidney stones, renal calculi, um, which would present with flank pain. Okay, also another thing you want to remember about these calcium supplements, they can interfere with the absorption of iron and thyroid hormones like Synthroid. So um, you don't want to give these together. They would, the patient would want to take them at a different time because it can affect absorption. Okay, another thing, another goal was to decrease those phosphate levels. How are we going to decrease phosphate levels? Sometimes the physicians will order phosphate binders, and this helps decrease phosphate levels through the excretion of phosphate in the stool. So if this medication works to um, take phosphate and put it in the stool, when's the best time to take the medication? after a meal when they've ate. And um, a common medication is aluminum carbonate. Okay, another thing, um, a physician may order, this medica medication hasn't been on the market too long, um, it's called parathyroid hormone replacement, which is NAPPARA, and it's given an injection. And some side effects of this is you want to monitor their calcium levels because it could flip them into hypercalcemia. Um, it can cause GI issues like nausea and vomiting and paresthesia, which is that neat, uh, tingling and numbness in the face and in the lips and the hands and the toes. Okay, so that is about hypoparathyroidism. Now go take that quiz on my website, registerednursrn.com, and be sure to check out the other thyroid NCLEX reviews. And thank you so much for watching, and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.